Hi guys, in this lecture we're going to talk about paired sample t-tests for mu. What we're going to be doing here is comparing the means from two groups. However, these two groups are matched or paired, and you could even say dependent in some meaningful way. So let's take a look at some of the fundamental concepts here. You have two samples, one from each population. Okay, in these two temp in each of these samples, we're going to have an observation that's going to be paired or matched in some meaningful way to an observation in the second sample. So this comes up a lot in pre-post studies. So um, we give students an exam on statistics on the first class, and then we teach them stats, and then they go and uh, they go through the whole course, they come back at the end of the semester, they take that same exam we gave them in the first day, uh, albeit with slightly different numbers, etc. And then we're interested to see if the class actually improved their knowledge of the, the topic of statistics. This is an example of where you could apply something. So you take the score from the, from the pre-class um, exam, and compare it to the post class. This also comes up in medicine a lot where you have some patients with an ailment, they come in, you do some blood work, you measure something, you determine that, uh, you know, maybe you measure white blood cell count, you give them the medication or the treatment, whatever it might be, and they go away, away uh, and come back taking that treatment after three months to come back, you measure that same thing, white blood cell count or whatever it is, and then you're interested in the difference. So in each of these examples, you can see that there's a connection between the observation from the first sample to the observation in the second sample. You could call it pre-post, but it doesn't have to be framed in time, okay? So this is, this is a marked difference to the topic that we dis talked about previously, which was in uh, comparing two means from independent samples. Okay, so this is the major difference. So now going forward with these paired uh, tests, what we're going to focus on is the difference between the paired observations. Okay, so to do this, we're going to have a, um, you, could, you could still think of the two groups as having their own mean, but what we're going to be interested in is reducing that to the difference. We'll call that the difference population. And anywhere you see a D, uh, that's what I mean here on these slides. So we're not interested in the mean in each of the two groups, the pre, the post, etc., per se, but the difference between the two numbers is, is, ca is going to capture what we're actually interested in. Okay, and of course, there's going to be a standard deviation for that difference population, etc. But this mu d is essentially what we are interested in uh, inferring about. Okay, so um, the actual conducting of the test is going to be done by you know taking a, a random sample from uh, of patients, perhaps that, or you know maybe they volunteer or, or something like this. Uh, to to be in the pre-study group and so you could even um, I could even visualize this for so we have like an X so X1 could be like the pre-group okay and then they go through some kind of treatment and then you have the post group and these are the measurements of the v numerical variable that we're studying okay and so you have some observations here and some observations here. The sample sizes are both going to be the same, right? Because these are all connected. If they aren't, that means that you had some missing data. So that's another clue that you're dealing with a paired study. Uh, in the comparison of two means with independent samples, you remember that the sample sizes could be different than each other. And then you needed the N1, N2 notation to distinguish the two sample sizes. Here, we don't have that issue. Okay, and what we're interested in is this third column. We kind of make this by just reducing the important information that we had collected, which is the differences. 
So here you'll, you'll have n differences, and that's what I'm referring to here as xd, okay? Um, so you're going to have n of these xds, you're going to have an x bar xd and an sd. So that means this, the mean of the differences, the sample mean of the differences, and the sample standard deviation of the differences. These are two important statistics that we need to compute from our difference sample. Okay, now with these two, we're going to compute our test statistic next. Um, but before we do that, let's just take a look at the form of the hypothesis tests in this type of, uh, of hypothesis. We're going to have um, the null hypothesis, which is what we initially assumed to be true, saying that the difference is equal to some hypothesized value, of course. For us, 99 out of 100 times, that's going to be zero. So 99 out of 100 times, the null hypothesis is going to be this. We're going to start out by assuming that there is no difference. Another way to put this is that there was no treatment effect. Whatever you did to the patient, to the subject, didn't make any difference from before to after. That's the null. Okay. Now the alternative can go one of three ways, as we're used to seeing so far. One is that the treatment increased whatever you were measuring, the treatment decreased whatever you're measuring, or the treatment changed, which is more general, two-sided alternative. Okay. Now let's take a look at the test statistic. Uh, now the condition we need to satisfy here before we can actually apply this particular method is that n is at least 30 or both the pre and post or both paired samples came from normal populations okay so check this this must be checked uh, out before you can um, prudently use this test statistic so it's a t test statistic so you know we're going to use the cutoff method unless you have access to a computer and you can get a p-value. This is a classical method that I've, I teach my students in classes where we don't have uh, um, computing so that they can um, get uh, to the conclusion of the hypothesis test without having to use any kind of um, interpolation. Okay, so the cutoff method, we've seen this before every time we've had a t-test statistic. And here's the test statistic here. It's actually quite simple. If you take away all the d's here, you're going to see that this is very similar to the test statistic we used in single sample hypothesis tests for the mean. Remember this? This also, sorry, the x bar. This also followed a t distribution with degrees of freedom n minus 1. Now, here, since we've created this difference population, we've essentially reduced these two samples, this pre and this post, to this third um, sample called the difference sample. Okay? And here, uh, we can basically treat this as a single sample t test. Okay? But you should always know that this is the difference. So it's, let's add these d's. Okay? And of course, this is the null value. So this is going to be 0 for us, of course, right? Because h o was that mu d equals 0. This will, this will follow a t distribution with degrees of freedom n minus 1 when this is satisfied. Okay? And we're going to use the cutoff method. Now, confidence interval, again, same condition. So check this large sample condition. You're going to get the point estimate and add and subtract the margin of error. And the margin of error is very simply arrived at with the T multiplier with a certain level of confidence, right? Degrees of freedom n minus 1, right? That comes from a T table. Standard deviation of the differences over the sample size. Okay. If you again, if you take away the d's, here, the d's here, this was exactly like the confidence interval for a single, from the single sample uh, mean, right? Okay. Let's do an example of this. We're going to construct a 99% confidence interval for the mean score difference from chess example on a previous slide. Okay. Uh, actually, that example is on the next slide. So. Take a look at this, pause this, work through this problem. Just take a couple, make, let me make a couple notes here. Um, we have um, 
a little snippet of the data given to you here. So I didn't, haven't given you all 12 observations that, that the study says were made, but I've given you a little taste of what this looks like because I think here it was fruitful to see that this um, was the difference population. So we created this column from these two by doing x1 minus x2. So you can do the math here. Uh, 510 minus 840, negative 340, sorry, 850, negative 340, 610 minus 790, negative uh, 180, etc. The important numbers here are the summary statistics, right, which was the average and standard deviation of the difference. So we can essentially forget about these now and we can just focus on this, okay? And uh, you're also asked to make a confidence interval. So give this a shot. Okay, pause. Okay, so you've given it a shot now. I'm going to take a, I'm going to kind of go through this uh, very quickly. The answers are on the next slides, but N is 12. We're told it's normally distributed, so our large sample condition is satisfied. Uh, we're asked, does chess improve memory? So that would mean like post scores are higher than pre scores, right? Uh, we're used, asked to use a significance level of 5%. Okay, and then we're asked to make a confidence interval too. So we want to see if chess improves memory. We, do, we give these memory tests. So let's take a look at the results. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. As you can see, well, what I did was I used um, one for the no chess lessons and two for the after taking chess lessons. So when I took the difference, I did mu1 minus mu2. Think about that. The way I did it, that would mean a negative number for mu d means improvement okay if you don't like that you could take the difference the other way but be careful you have to stay consistent so having said that the null is that there's no difference the alternative is that that difference is less than zero which means improvement because that means mu1 was less than mu2 so this would be a negative number that means improvement right you have to go through that logic very slowly you could think about it like this as well Okay, now having the statements uh, written out, alpha 0.05, we check that we have the large camp sample condition satisfied. We do, n is less than 30, but we have a normal population, so we can go forward. Um, we compute the, we use the summary statistics given to us by the problem along with the assumption of normality, very important. We compute the test statistic, negative 4.56. We know this was a one tail test and specifically that it was a left tail test because of the alternative. So I set up my rejection region on the left tail of a T distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom. So that's 11. I get my cutoff which was uh, I believe negative 1.798. So get this from the table. Here's the cutoff. Then final step, my test statistic is definitely inside the rejection region. Therefore, I reject HO and conclude that there is convincing evidence that chess improves memory scores, at least for this population of, of, of uh, subjects that we studied, which was sixth graders. Okay. And then finally, construct a 99, I believe, percent confidence interval. We take x bar d plus or minus t multiplier for 99% confidence level. 11 degrees of freedom comes straight from the table. SD, standard deviation of the differences over square root of n. Okay, so this is the margin of error. This whole thing I'm putting a box around. You add and subtract that margin of error to the point estimate, which was x bar d. All these numbers came from the problem, right? This one came from the table. And once you do that, you get the left uh, lower boundary and upper boundary. And the last thing I want to talk about here is how to interpret this. So remember, when we do in confidence intervals for these two sample um, studies, zero is oftentimes a very interesting position. In the, in, in the scheme of the number line. Why? Because when you're taking the difference between two things, zero is where there's no difference. So it's a very special place. This particular interval is completely on one side of zero. That's a very conclusive interval because it doesn't 
contain zero in it. If it did contain zero in it, it would be inconclusive. But since zero is not in it, and on top of that, it's completely on this side of zero, that's telling me that at 99% confidence, the difference, the average difference between children who never play chess and children who regularly play chess is a negative number. And if you remember the order that I subtracted the pre to post, negative meant improvement. So what we can conclude here is that we're 99% sure that the difference, average difference um, was negative, i.e. chess improved um, memory skills. Okay. Now, one last thing, if you did this math on the differences in the opposite way, these numbers would just be positive. Uh, they would just be negations of what they are. And then these summary statistics, the mean would be the same number, but positive 144. Standard deviation will always be a positive number. That's not going to change. Your test statistic will be, sorry, before even that, your alternative hypothesis will be the other way. This will be positive. Your test statistic, do the math. This will be positive. This will be positive. You're on a right tail test now. So your rejection region will be on the right tail of the same distribution at that same point, except positive 1.98. And you will reject the null with the same degree of certainty as you did um, the first time. So as long as you stay consistent and think it through, especially when you do the alternative hypothesis, your results will be identical. All right. So hope this was helpful. Continue watching for further lectures on hypothesis testing and statistics in general. Have a great day.